Uh, and the question that I'm posing is a question that I'm also trying to pose in our seminar, which is uh, how we stabilize the distinction between violence and nonviolence and whether we can stabilize it. If we can't stabilize it, why not? Um, now, it seems to me that when we begin to debate philosophically whether we are in favor of nonviolence, we usually have to stop to define our terms. How do we delimit violence, and do we all agree on the various forms that violence can take? What if we talk about policies or even failures to act that lead to the destruction of lives? There is no physical blow, and so no discrete act of physical violence performed by one body upon another. And yet it seems that most of us would be relatively uncomfortable with the claim that only a physical blow qualifies as violence. When Foucault introduced the notion of biopolitics, he was surely trying to describe policies and regulations that manage or regulate the life of populations. <clears throat> One consequence of modern forms of biopower is that certain populations are considered more disposable, more lightly abandoned than others. It led Foucault to open up the question of how biopolitics operates through state racism, though he did not exactly pursue that thought. One claim of his seems important as we approach the question of how to delimit the sphere of violence. If a population proves to be disposable, it may not be because a particular subject has decided that this should be the case. We cannot always track such policies to a deciding subject. In fact, it may be that the general logic of the biopolitical determines in part who will count as a subject and who will not. And this last has a great deal to do with the question of whose lives can be safeguarded against violence and whose can be abandoned to violence. In effect, Foucault gives us a way to understand how demographic assumptions operate in our moral debates about violence and nonviolence. <clears throat> in the final chapter of Foucault's 1976 lecture course, Society Must Be Defended, he elaborates on the emergence of the biopolitical field in the 19th century. For Foucault, this is a distinct kind of power, inasmuch as it is exercised over humans by virtue of their status as living beings. Sometimes he calls that living status a biological one, though he does not exactly tell us which version of biological science he has in mind. Foucault describes the biopolitical as a power to make live or to let die, distinguished from the sovereign power to take life or let live. As in many instances in his work, power is less a sovereign act than a mode of managing populations as living creatures, managing lives and livability, making them live, letting them die. Of course, to let die is not exactly an action, but neither is it a simple omission. It's a doing nothing in the face of something calling to be done. We might say that subjects do nothing, and we hold them accountable for this, especially when, indeed, something is there to be done. But what is, um, uh, uh, how do we think about patterned ways of doing nothing in the face of populations who are left to die? Um, uh, we can think, of course, about the populations seeking entrance to Europe um, who, who are left at borders or or lost at sea? Um, how do we think about a patterned mode of response um, that comes to be replicated through policies? Perhaps there are individuals who are making those decisions, but perhaps there are policies that start to constitute what it is to be a European subject. Is not doing anything in the face of an ethical demand to do something a form of violence, or do we call it by another name? It would follow, I believe, that forms of biopower regulate, among other things, the very livability of life, determining the relative life potential of populations. This sort of power is documented in mortality and natality rates that indicate forms of racism that belong to biopolitics. We can think of Ruth Wilson Gilmore's uh, now quite famous uh, uh, formulation, and I, I'll quote it again, Racism, specifically, is the state-sanctioned or extra-legal production and exploitation of group-differentiated vulnerability to premature death. 
It emerges as well in forms of pronatalism and pro-life positions that regularly privilege some sorts of life or living tissue over others, such as teenage or adult women. Important for the purposes of trying to start a debate about nonviolence, and we have not yet really started, in case you've noticed. Uh, indeed, this evening, we're going to stay together. We're going to huddle together in a preliminary stage of reflection. Um, uh, important is sorting out not only what violence is, but how it happens through what means. Violence waged against living creatures can only be conceptualized if a creature is living. But if we cannot conceptualize the living character of the creature, is violence possible at all? In the context of Foucault's discussion of how biopolitics works, and our question about the specificity of the violence by which it works, he remarks that there is no a priori right to life. A right to life first must be established in order to be exercised. Under conditions of political sovereignty, for instance, a right to life and even a right over one's own life and death comes to exist only for those who have already been constituted as rights-bearing subjects. Under biopolitical conditions, however, the right to life is much more ambiguous since power manages populations rather than distinct subjects subjected to sovereign power. So what happens if a life is not generally registered as a life, if Foucault could claim very clearly that a right to life belongs only to a subject who is already constituted as a rights-bearing subject, one for whom life is a necessary right, can we not also claim that the status of a living being must first be constituted for someone to become a subject with the right to life? If racism is a way of, and here is Foucault's phrase, introducing a break into the domain of life that is under power's control, then perhaps we can think of that break as not merely distinguishing between superior and inferior types within the idea of a species, but also as distinguishing the living and the non-living. After all, if a non-living population is destroyed, then nothing of note has happened. There is no destruction, just a certain clearing away of an obstruction from the path of the truly living. Power is already operating through schemas of racism that persistently distinguish not only between lives that are more or less valuable, more and or less grievable, but also between lives that register more or less emphatically as lives. A life can register as a life only within a schema that presents it as such, the epistemological nullification or foreclosure of the living character of a population, the very definition of a genocidal epistemology, structures the field of the living along a continuum that has concrete implications for the question, whose are the lives that are worth preserving, whose lives matter, whose lives are grievable. One might, with more time, make use of Fanon's idea of the historic racial schema, which we've been discussing in the seminar, to explain how it is possible to claim this is or was a life, or these are or were lives, and how such a claim is demographically bound up with another. These are lives worth living, worth preserving, and these are lives that ought to be, the condi ought to be given the condition to live and to be registered and recognized as lives. So in the United States, when unarmed black women or men have their backs turned to the police and are walking or running away and are still sometimes gunned down by police, an action often later defended as self-defense, even a defense of society, how are we to understand this? Is that turning of the head or walking or running away actually an aggressive advance anticipated by the police? The police person who decides to shoot or who simply finds himself shooting may or may not be deliberating, but it surely seems that a phantasm has seized upon that thought process, inverting the figures and the movement he sees to justify in advance any lethal action he may take. The violence that the policeman is about to do, the violence he then commits, has already moved toward him in a figure a racialized ghost, as it were, condensing and inverting his own aggression, wielding his own aggression against himself, acting in advance, in advance of his own plans to act, legitimating and elaborating as if in a dream 
his later argument of self-defense. European racism perhaps takes different forms, but the efforts to block migrants to Europe are in part rooted in, a, in the desire to keep Europe white. It hardly matters that Europe has never been exclusively white, since the idea of European whiteness is a fantasy that seeks to be realized at the expense of a living population that includes people from North Africa, Turkey, and the Middle East. If we follow Foucault on biopower and read him, perhaps, together with Ashio Mbembe, then we confront policies that reproduce this metric of grievability. The thousands of migrants who've lost their lives in the Mediterranean <clears throat> are precisely those whose lives were deemed not worthy of safeguarding. There doesn't have to be a subject actively deeming or not deeming for that particular differential of value to take place. Those waters, by the way, are monitored for the purposes of trade, maritime safety. There is often cell coverage, so how many countries have to disavow responsibility for those people to be left to die? Even if we could track the decision not to send help to boats in distress to this or that functionary in a European government, we, we would not quite grasp the large-scale policy that effectively lets populations die, that would rather let them die than let them in. On the one hand, these are decisions, and we can track who is accountable for deciding in this way. On the other hand, the metric of grievability is built into those decisions in such a way that migrant populations are considered ungrievable from the start. Can we even, lo can we even lose those whom we cannot grieve? Or is it only through grief that we come to apprehend the loss? What if a population is, as it were, beyond losing, already lost, never admitted, never living, never entitled to life, never having to be brought to life through that entitlement. All of these forms of taking life or managing livability are not just concrete examples of how the metric of grievability works, determining and distributing the grievability and value of lives. They're the concrete operations of the metric itself, its technologies, its points of application. And in these instances, we see the convergence of the biopolitical logic of the historic racial schema in which the living status of the migrant fails to be registered within the perceptual field of the grievable. That life is already snuffed out from the start. Such a life did not register as life, a life worth preserving. <clears throat> so this brings me then to the broader question of how it is <clears throat> that we regulate who is grievable and who is not grievable, and how that enters into our decision-making process or our moral reflections on violence and nonviolence. Perhaps there is a metric of grievability that establishes an implicit framework within which we debate the question of violence and nonviolence. We can see that demography is in the mix, but I also have a second question. How is law or the legal regime in the mix as well? <coughs> Um, uh, within uh, which uh, um, uh, legal framework can violence be thought as violence um, and nonviolence be thought as nonviolence? What constitutes and consolidates a legal framework uh, that regulates the distinction between nonviolence and violence? How does that consolidation of the legal framework establish legitimate ways of distinguishing violence and nonviolence? Indeed, is there a way to think violence and nonviolence outside the legal framework that gains its legitimacy in part through the very regulation of that distinction? Indeed, at stake, I would say, uh, um, uh, in a broader project, one that I can't pursue tonight, is to think about uh, the legal re regulation of violence and nonviolence how those categories are determined in relationship to biopolitical regulation more generally. Um, and this will have implications for our ability to say what violence is, what it includes, and how it works. Um, given the instances of violence that I've uh, just enumerated, racism in the US or indeed of the European variety, state racism in particular, we may be simply drawn to the conclusion that what's needed is a stronger and a more just sense of law, and that 
that law, whether uh, national or international, should be brought to bear on such instances. Of course, I have no doubt that better law is obligatory. But to argue in that way, we have first to know what the relation is between violence and law. Should we look to law to provide an alternative to violence? We cannot readily accept the idea that some primary violence is overcome once we make the transition from a pre-legal sociality to a legal order. As we know, there are fascist and racist legal regimes that immediately discount that view. State racism always involves a legal dimension of state power. We could say <clears throat> that where, where there is racist law or fascist law, then those are instances of bad law. Um, and we could say that those regimes are not really lawful. And then we could offer a normative stipulation of what law should be through a description of what it really is, disputing its false and nefarious appearances. But I'm not sure that any of those particular moves, worthy as they may be, address the fundamental questions how does the legally binding character of law require and institute coercion? And how is this form of coercion distinguishable from legal violence, if it is? So one question that emerges here, and one reason I turn to the question of law, is because I want to understand how the distinction between violence and nonviolence is instrumentalized here. Why is it so difficult to simply begin with a definition of violence, right? You know, we're debating violence, nonviolence. Let's say what violence is. Let's de let's define our terms, and then we proceed. Um, why is it that violence only seems approachable through an oscillation of frameworks? One seeks to grab hold of the definition only to find that one has been seized instead by a framework which makes possible the stabilization of the definition itself. Indeed, it's not only that one form of violence shape shifts into another, but the very distinction between violence and nonviolence can invert, calling into question the stability of the distinction. How are we to proceed when that instability continues to recur? I shift here, perhaps precipitously, to Walter Benjamin and his considerations of violence in A Critique of Violence, since he offers us an account of why and how that oscillation between violence and nonviolence can occur. Within that text, there are shifting frameworks within which violence homonymically repeats itself. We're never quite sure whether this is one violence in many forms or many forms of violence, whether they overlap in ways that can be described. There is, you will remember, law instating violence, law preserving violence, mythic violence, divine violence. Divine violence has driven many readers mad, and one reason is that in relation to this term, it is not always possible to distinguish violence and nonviolence. Benjamin documents what happens to terms such as violence and nonviolence once we understand that the frameworks within which those definitions are secured are themselves vacillating. He remarks that a legal regime that seeks to monopolize violence must call every threat or challenge to that regime a violent one. Hence, it can rename its own violence as necessary or obligatory force, even as justifiable coercion. And because it works through the law, as the law, it is legal and therefore presumably justified. Within that framework, one which he calls fate, the law is justified. Why? Because it is the law. And it is only within the established legal framework that we, begin, we can begin to distinguish between justifiable and unjustifiable violence. But that legal framework permits no inquiry into its own justification. It supplies legitimate justification, but remains itself as a framework unjustified. What justification does the framework give for this? It seeks recourse to a lazy and redundant form of positivism that remarks endlessly on the necessity of its own tautology. One can ask whether the law itself is legitimate, not only this or that law, but the legal regime itself, but one cannot ask it within the framework. The legal regime establishes the justificatory scheme that defends and sanitizes its own legal violence at the same time that it names as violent whatever threatens that regime. 
So even the question, what gives a particular regime its legitimacy, is understood as an act of violence, a violent speech act. And the reason is precisely because all questions of legitimacy and justification can only be formulated within the given legal framework, and that is the first stipulation of legal violence, the first of its many violent acts. So it's not only the loss of the monopoly on violence that the legal regime counters so forcefully and with the accusation of violence, but the posing of the question of whether or not the state and its legal apparatus are legitimate. The attribution of violence under such conditions and by such authorities thus establishes any act, even the posing of a question about violence that is not already within the obligatory framework established by and for legal violence as itself violent. At this point, we can see how something called critique, in his view, which queries the production and self-validation of schemes of justification can easily be called violence. Indeed, to make it more or less plain, for Benjamin, any inquiry, any statement, any action that calls into question the framework of legal violence within which the justificatory schemes are established will itself be called violent, and the opposition to such a fundamental form of querying will be understood as a legal effort to contain and quash a threat to the rule of law. Interestingly, the only time that Benjamin explicitly names nonviolence in that text is in relation to what he calls nonviolent conflict resolution, which takes place, as some of you know, through what he calls a technique of civil governance. This technique is, importantly, not governed by any specific end. It is not trying to achieve a goal. It is a technique that is governed neither by an instrumental logic nor by a teleological scheme of development. It is ongoing, open-ended, what he calls pure means. And in this way, it is another name for his developing notion of critique as an active mode of thought or understanding unconstrained by instrumental logics or teleological movements, querying the limits and modes of operation of justificatory schemes established by legal violence and established for the future as a tautological method for legal violence. Benjamin writes that a totally nonviolent resolution of conflicts can never lead to a legal contract, since for him the contract is the beginning of legal violence. He later clarifies that, and of course this is a really important moment in his text that has been worked over by many of us here and elsewhere, um, uh, he clarifies that, and I quote, there is a sphere of human agreement that is nonviolent to the extent that it is wholly inaccessible to violence. The proper sphere of understanding, comma, language. Die eigentliche Sphere der Verständigung, die Sprache. What account of language is this in which it is at once synonymous with understanding and nonviolence, right? Die Sprache, understanding, nonviolence. Written within a year's time, the task of the translator seems indirectly referenced here. In that text, Benjamin does not refer to violence and nonviolence, but he does insist that the problem of translation relies on a conception of language that furthers or augments what he calls communicability or impartability, mitteilbarkeit, a term that figures prominently in Kant's critique of judgment. Translation overcomes an apparent non-communicability, an impasse that is imposed by distinct, distinct natural or sensuous languages. Translation from one text to another helps to develop and further realize an ideal intrinsic to language, language as such, one which overcomes impasse and the failure of communication and contact. If in 1916, in his essay on language as such and the languages of man, Benjamin insisted it is the divine name that moves past communicative impasse, understood as a paradigmatic instance of creative divine language, or what he called the divine infinity of the pure word, in 1921, the non-sensuous intention that runs through all languages is once again named the divine word. But what is meant is not that a divine presence speaks, but only that any given language is, 
implicitly, potentially translatable. The problem for him is not whether the right translator can be found, but whether a text or indeed a language is translatable at all, even under the best of circumstances. There are, in his view, and this is important, laws, laws governing translation that lie within the original, and translation ultimately serves the purpose of expressing the innermost relationship of languages to one another. It is the dilemma after Babel. It links the task of translation to furthering an understanding where there was once impasse or even conflict. In this way, the emphatically non-juridical law or laws that govern translation are associated with that extra juridical domain of non-violence identified in a critique of violence. Interestingly, the commandment figured in a critique of violence is also said to be non-coercive and non-violent. That is to say, it comes with no police force and all it can do is instigate a disputatious encounter with the subject to whom it is addressed. It cannot compel obedience. It's a very interesting idea of the commandment. Um, so what kind of law is this if it is a law that comes with no enforcement and cannot compel obedience? The commandment is in some sense God's word. In the task of the translator, the reference to law is not exactly a reference to a principle. It cannot, uh, it certainly cannot be codified in any exhaustive sense. Even when it arrives in scriptural form, it is only between the lines that God's word reverberates. Is this then a law at work, a spoken word transposed into written text, yet not reducible to any set of written lines. The gap between the spoken and the written seems to be graphically staged as interlinearity. The law that governs translation has something to do with God's word. That word is figured as an intention, an intentio, that runs through all languages and can only be realized through the act of translation, of course, and never fully realized. Clearly drawing in part on biblical hermeneutics, Benjamin maintains that a translation can only reproduce the original text by breaking with the original, releasing, as it were, its afterlife in a different language. A continuity is established only through a break that allows the first to become reanimated or further animated in the second. Moreover, that translation, understood as the second or derivative text, acts upon the original, altering not only that text, but infiltrating and expanding the language in which it was written. Something foreign enters into the second text, and correspondingly, the second text pervades the first, effectively making it into a different language than it was before. Benjamin enters this citation from Rudolf Panwitz into his text, and I quote, our translations, even the best ones, proceed from a mistaken premise. They want to turn Hindi, Greek, English into German instead of turning German into Hindi, Greek, English. The translator must expand and deepen his language by means of the foreign language. Indeed, this reciprocal activity of translation alters and expands each language brought into contact through translation and through that process of expanding the domain of communicability itself partially realizes that nonsensical intention that runs through all languages. Indeed, there is no language without its impartability. If a language could not be imparted to another, it would not be a language. This ideal of an expanding and intensifying communicability maintains an important resemblance in um, what we find in a critique of violence, um, namely his reference to language, die Sprache, as the sphere of agreement wholly inaccessible to violence. On the one hand, this technique of civil governance in a critique of violence, described as an ongoing mode of conflict resolution, relies on an idea of language, even language as such, that has within it the constitutive possibility of translatability that is already open to becoming something foreign or open to being infiltrated and remade by the foreign. Every language is thus a foreign language from the start. 
This means that however impervious languages are to one another, they still bear somewhere within them the character of impartability, and that the sensuous differences among languages can be overcome in an effort to enhance and further a process of understanding constrained neither by pre-established context nor teleological end, and whose open-ended activity constitutes a form of conflict resolution without end. Conflict resolution without end. This is, I think, a moment of great idealism, perhaps linguistic idealism, but what else did we have to do tonight? Um, it might be an ambiguous use of a religious figure of a di divine word, a word, by the way, that is described as divine without there being any indication of a god in the background. It's kind of interesting. If there is something divine, it seems to function adjectivally. What's the relation then between that divine word that unfolds through the complex process of translation and what is called divine violence, that term that drives all of us mad that we find in a critique of violence? How can we relate divine violence to the scenario of conflict resolution? That latter is explicitly called nonviolent. Divine violence, is this the resurgence of an anachronism? Is this the pre-modern rearing its head in a distinctively anti-parliamentary and anti-democratic turn, as Dara Dodge suggested in Force of Law? Is it aptly illustrated by the disturbing example he gives, even as he tells us that divine violence cannot be properly exemplified at all? Well, let me suggest briefly that that aspect of language that allows translation to be possible, sometimes called the intentio of language, is also described as messianic, and in the essay on language as such, it is explicitly called the divine word. Indeed, this active furthering of the divine word is precisely not a word that can be found in any text, but only in the interlinear regions of the text. It is found, he tells us, in the compositional unity of a painting, but is not found in what is expressed there. It is, uh, in his terms, the expressionless, the ausdruckslos. Is it possible that divine violence could very well be related to this technique of nonviolent civil governance, this enhanced, potentially infinite modality of understanding that he understands as furthered both by translation and conflict resolution? If so, we may ask, why does he still call it violence? Is he simply remarking that, it's, that it is considered as violent from within the framework of legal violence? Is he given vo giving voice to that naming practice? And if its paradigmatic act is the strike, which is a collective refusal to act, then in what way can a concerted non-action, such as a strike, be regarded as violent? What is called divine violence is not an act of any kind, but rather a way of going on strike, withdrawing support for legal violence, not a performative, but as Werner Hamacher has argued, an aformative, an erosion of action itself. For Benjamin, it's not that we retract our freedom, since under conditions of fate, or legal positivism, we were never freely supporting the laws imposed upon us. We did not willingly call down that legal imposition. It was unwilled from the start, acting coercively as part of our legal subjectivation, and that is one reason he calls it fate. The strike or the non-action that depletes and disempowers legal violence is less an act of freedom than a form of expiation. We move, we move through and past that form of guilt that binds us to the law, and the purging of that form of guilt is what opens up the possibility of an extra juridical form of social and linguistic exchange, the one Benjamin calls nonviolence. The path to nonviolence seems to be the expiation of guilt. And why is that? It is because we are guilty only within the schemes of accountability established by legal violence. Guilt is the subjectivating instance of legal violence. Divine violence is destructive only because it destroys those bonds by which guilt secures our status as good citizens, good legal subjects. It destroys legal violence and in doing so establishes the possibility of extra legal exchange. It is that extra-legal exchange that Benjamin calls nonviolence. <laughs> so divine violence might be said to be precipitating or opening up the sphere of nonviolence. 
<clears throat> Within such an analysis, we cannot quite start with a definition of violence and then proceed to debate under what conditions violence is justified or not. That is to make use of the justificatory scheme that we have to think about historically, critically. And the reason we cannot start that way is that violence is from the start defined within certain frameworks and comes to us already interpreted, worked over by its frame. The historicity um, uh, of that working over is congealed in the discursive framework within which violence appears, and that tends to be one in which legal violence, and we might add institutional forms of violence, are generally occluded. If one refuses to answer the question, which sorts of violence are justified and which are not, precisely because one wants to call attention to the limited justificatory schemes that frame the question, then one risks a certain in unintelligibility and or one becomes a certain kind of threat. So on the one hand, as we can see, radical crit critical inquiries into the legitimating grounds for a legal order can be called violent acts, and so too can democratic forms of protest, as we saw in Geze Park in Turkey or uh, in Ferguson um, in the United States, in Palestine and in Ayotzinapa. In Ayotzinapa, Mexico, the 43 students who were massacred were in the, in the course of assembling to protest austerity cuts at their university. They were boarding buses to take them to Mexico City, and there they intended to take part in a demonstration of mourning and protest for students massacred in 1968 during a public demonstration, massacred by the police. So, they, so then these students boarding the bus were themselves disappeared, um, presumably massacred for exercising rights of assembly and protest, but also for attempting to mark and mourn the horrific killings of those who sought to exercise those rights 46 years earlier. Indeed, even now, the parents and friends of those massacred, presumably massacred in late September of last year, cannot secure the material evidence that the disappeared have been killed because the state refuses to acknowledge the existence of any such evidence. Until the state gives that evidence, they will not mourn. Refusing to mourn becomes a way of continuing the demand. Of course, that assembly, that student assembly, was called violent by the local authorities. But in what sense or within what framework could that possibly be true? Is it that they sought to undermine and destroy legal violence and so made themselves eligible to be called violent from within that particular legal framework? Whatever then is called violence is regarded as violent from a particular perspective embedded in a defining framework. I don't think there's any way to begin uh, to debate violence and nonviolence without asking how the terms are defined and positioned uh, within a particular framework. Without being able to identify that framework, we cannot even begin uh, the question. I think there's no way out of this problem, since violence is, as it were, always already interpreted, always already framed. That does not mean that violence can be wished away or that it's all a matter of subjective opinion. This is not a paper in favor of relativism. On the contrary, violence is precisely that which is perpetually subjected to an oscillation of frameworks. We saw how this works in Talal Assad's important analysis of death dealing. Some forms are justified, even glorified, and others are disparaged and condemned. Depending on the state, state-sanctioned violence is justified. Non-state-based violence is unjustified. Indeed, with the support of some versions of the state, the death dealing is said to be done in the name of justice and democracy, and in the non-state-based violence, the death dealing is considered to be criminal or terrorist. The methods may be similar or different, and their destructive power may be equal or equally horrific, and yet the fact that life is taken away in quite brutal forms within each framework does, not, does it not suggest a greater proximity among forms of death dealing than we might expect. Indeed, perhaps only through a contrapuntal analysis, one that draws perhaps on both Said and Godard, might we track the oscillation of frameworks within which the debates, or rather the discourse, about justified and unjustified violence occur. 
In Spivak's term, we would not only be tracking the oscillating way that a particular action or inaction is named violent in one context and nonviolent in another, but marking the very epistemic violence that tosses us from one frame to another, the untrackable and sudden shifts mainly suffered and barely understood. One might well consider as nonviolent tactics like the strike, the hunger strike in prison, work stoppages, um, forms of occupying government or official buildings or spaces or those whose private and public status is being contested, boycotts of various kinds, including consumer and cultural boycotts, sanctions, but also public assemblies, petitions, ways of refusing to recognize illegitimate authority or declining to vacate institutions that have illegitimately been closed. What tends to unify such actions or inactions, depending on your interpretation, is that they are all calling into question the legitimacy of a set of policies or actions, or even in the case of the general strike, the legitimacy of a specific form of rule. And yet all of them can, by virtue of calling for a change in police, state formation, or rule, be called destructive, since they do ask for a substantial alteration of the status quo, raising the very question of legitimacy, thus becomes regarded as a violent act. So though I am, yes, in favor of stronger laws that would better protect lives against abandonment and violence, it would be a mistake to think that it's only by expanding laws that these kinds of violence will be overcome. Under certain conditions, the expansion of law can be the expansion of violence. That is surely the case with racist and fascist law, the laws that expand police powers and abrogate basic rights, or the laws that fill prisons with vulnerable populations, restricting and redefining the public sphere. Moreover, if we seek to object to, object to unjust laws and unjust legal systems, <clears throat> we often do have to take up a position outside of the law to formulate our critique. Does that make us criminal or merely critical? I just wonder if there's some water. Oh, there's water. Benjamin's point, I think, remains incisive. The mistake is to consider that legal violence, precisely because it is legal, is therefore justified, and that forms of resistance to legal regimes, precisely because they are not based on existing law, are therefore criminal or violent. As we've noted, a legal regime produces a framework, a framework which makes sense of only certain kinds of justification. Any actions that contest that regime are deemed violent because they do not or will not conform to the framework and the justifications it provides. Not conforming with the established legal framework appears as a crime or is called a crime, but the word crime marks a passage from one legal regime to another. In other words, the passage is criminal, but once the passage is completed, the criminality falls away, the name no longer does its descriptive work. Of course, Benjamin famously fails to take us on that passage from one legal regime to another. He stops us in the middle of the passage, abandoning us precisely there. There seems to be no passage from one legal regime to another without moving from one violence to another violence. The destruction of legal violence, however, is divine violence, which is why, contrary to the fearful interpretations that many people have made, divine violence can never be state violence, at least not for Benjamin. If we were to be part of a revolution that sought to bring down one legal framework characterized by legal violence in order to posit less, a less violent way of organizing political life, even a nonviolent way, we would only be making a passage through divine violence, but we would not um, remain within the apparatic passage that is divine violence. Even so, it seems clear that no one can make the passage um, taking down one legal regime to building another without at some point being accused of criminal violence. Right? That accusation is always uh, is waiting in the wings. Um, even, and, um, even if later that criminal, that violent criminal becomes a hero of a new nonviolent democracy. Even as no one raises a fist against another body, and even if no set of bodies were left to die, the passage is still considered an attack, an attack on the given law, the body of the law, on the justifications for violence that only that law can provide. Okay, well, at this point, perhaps we can see that something called critique, 
um, in Benjamin's view, which queries the production and self-validation of schemes of justification, can easily be called violence and even um, be said to sustain a relation to what Benjamin calls divine violence. On the one hand, Benjamin offers us a way to debunk a spurious charge that a critical relation to a legal regime is by definition a violent one, even when it pursues nonviolent means. On the other hand, the position of critique, the one that does not accept the justificatory schemes established within the legal framework, is what he associates with what he calls divine violence, pure power over all life for the sake of the living, a power distinct from law that seems to have as its principal aim the deconstitution of a legal regime. Oddly, divine violence includes forms of adamant non-action, refusals to participate, refusals to eat, refusing to reproduce, reproduce oneself as a subject bound by a particular regime of law. Whatever divine violence may be, we can never, it seems, offer a definitive example. It hovers about the example, obeying, it seems, an interdiction on the image. But we do know that it is not state violence, that it does not characterize theological states, and that its aim is to deconstitute legal violence and state power. Although I do not fully follow Benjamin to his anarchist conclusion, I do accept an anarchist passage, perhaps a passage through divine violence understood as nonviolence. That means that I accept that we cannot simply start with the definition of violence and then proceed to debate under what conditions violence is or is not justified. Such a procedure makes use of the very justificatory scheme about which we have to think historically and critically. How did it come to be? What justifies its existence? What does it exclude? What does it include? The reason we cannot start that way is that violence is from the start defined within certain frameworks. It comes to us always already interpreted and worked over by its frame. The historicity of that working over is congealed in the discursive framework within which violence appears, and that tends to be one in which legal violence, and we might add institutional forms of violence, are generally occluded. Um, so if one refuses to play by the rules, to say which kinds of violence do you justify, what do you mean by nonviolence, what is its justification, um, one does uh, become either unintelligible or immoral. Um, um, so um, I guess here I would simply say that um, uh, violence is always interpreted within a framework, so we can't always agree on what constitutes its empirical instance. There are ways of renaming and failing to name the very same act that plague the moral and legal debates on violence. So I began this paper with the consideration of Foucault, and then I turned to Benjamin. There are outstanding questions about that transition that I cannot fully answer this evening. But one is whether legal violence always acts in the form of sovereign power, or whether it functions through biopolitical means. I'm not sure that every legal system gains its legitimation through recourse to sovereign power. Legal regulation, including those that govern immigration, may seem to emerge from sovereign powers or authorities like the European Union that seem to be distributed and condensed forms of sovereignty. But when we consider how laws are enacted or fail to be enacted, how they exist on the book but not in practice, how the entire field of implementation draws upon racist schemes to differentially apply rights and laws, and even how rights and laws do not always form a coherent unity, um, it seems to me we're left in a quandary. At such moments when the management of life and death are quite central, it may be that power assumes forms that are not precisely derived from a sovereign center, which is why I have thought that Agamben, for all of his incisive readings of Foucault, makes a mistake when he imagines that biopower is finally subject to sovereign power. Moral philosophy begins with the question of whether violence is ever justified, but it does not always ask what counts as violence, what, call, what counts as a justification. I point this out not because I think violence is a matter of subjective opinion, but because I think that questioning what violence is and how it works, and what serves as a justification and what does not, help us to situate the debate within a set of terms that function quite powerfully to constrain our ability to think critically beyond the present horizon. What and who is living? What counts as violence and what does not? Within which framework and what language are such matters treated as settled? 
These days, violence is always potentially here where we are, not only located in state power. And yet so many of our debates assume that we need only ask whether violence is state sanctioned to know whether or not it is justified. Depending on the state, state sanctioned violence is treated as justified, non-state based violence is unjustified. But with the support of some versions of the state, death dealing is said to be done in the name of justice and democracy, and in non-state based violence, death dealing is criminal or terrorist. The methods may be similar or different, their destructive power may be equal or equally horrific. And yet the fact that life is taken away within both framework does not always lead to the insight that there might be greater proximity among these forms of violence, these forms of death dealing, than we might otherwise uh, be led to believe. Um, <clears throat> so um, I guess what I want to uh, suggest um, thinking, adding Benjamin to this mix is, is that to halt a violent regime is very often called violent, um, even if it is not halted through physically violent means. Um, uh, and so um, uh, it may be that our naming practice has to undergo a translation from one uh, epistemic framework to another, and that we ourselves have to become translators between these frameworks in order to begin uh, the process of understanding why uh, violence and nonviolence are constantly subjected to these oscillating frames. It would seem that we passed um, into, uh, if, if we call the cessation of legal violence violent, then we've committed a catechesis of a sort using the name in a way that seems rather improper. It would seem that we passed into another language where names or the sound of the name no longer refers in one way. And to call this cessation of legal violence divine seems to recall what Benjamin claimed in 1916 or what he was constantly considering between 16 and 20, namely that the divine name marks the problem of translation, which is of course another problem of passage. Not just the question of how to translate this or that passage, but the very possibility of a passage from one language, one framework into another that potentially infinite expansion of communicability turns out to be the only instance of nonviolence that Benjamin can name in a critique of violence. He insisted that the divine name moves past communicative impasse, and I suggested to you that this is part of what is meant or at work in the technique of civil governance. Benjamin is engaging a naming practice at the moment in which violence come to na comes to name the cessation of legal violence. Perhaps he's miming those who would call violent even nonviolent forms of resistance to legal violence. He's showing, he's showing, he's enacting how that name can be redeployed in, in the instances where it would seem to be most um, intuitively uh, uh, foreign. Um, perhaps this is an instance of a critical miming practice, translating um, the language of one framework into another, not just situating that naming practice critically within political frameworks and their self-justificatory schemes, but acting, renaming, destroying the one instance of the word by using it now to name its, um, its opposite. Um, I think that I will uh, just stop there and thank you for your attention and open it up for... Thank you.